languages for HBO's uh, Game of Thrones, although his uh, interest in uh, language creation goes uh, way, way back beyond that. Um, so he, it's probably obvious from his age once you see him that he was not involved uh, with the creation of any of the languages for Star Wars. So he mentions uh, some of the uh, bad examples in his recent book on uh, uh, language construction, some bad examples from uh, Return of the Jedi in particular that was part of the motivation for his interest in, in language creation. Um, so he's part of, uh, I'd say, a burgeoning interest and kind of at the forefront of a lot of interest, uh, partially internet-fed in, in language creation. And uh, uh, as an interesting anecdote we learned last night over dinner, he, he uh, won uh, this uh, contest to create the Dothraki language. Uh, he participated in a contest and won it. And uh, as part of the language design, there's no word for, for please in the Dothraki language. Um, so he's also president of the... Uh, um, Language Construction Society? Did I, I, I was president of the Language Creation Society. Okay, the Language Creation Society was at, at uh, some point in the past. Um, and uh, so today he's going to talk about his work uh, constructing languages. Uh, so uh, join me in welcoming David. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, can everybody in the back hear me if I talk like this? Perfect. All right. I usually wander around a little bit, but I see the way these screens are. They kind of want me to stay right here. So uh, <laughs> I guess I'll do that. Oh, oh, and there's a camera too, right? So I'm going to try to look straight at this camera <laughs> the entire time. Anyway, um, so yeah, my name is David. I've created uh, the following languages. So for Game of Thrones, I've created uh, these uh, three languages, but I've also worked on a number of other uh, television shows. Um, and a couple of movies since then. So I uh, worked on a show called Defiance on the Sci-Fi Network, uh, for which I created uh, these four languages, and I also got the opportunity to create writing systems for them, which was really, really cool. Um, still trying to convince uh, Game of Thrones to let me do the uh, High Valyrian uh, orthography, but uh, they're content with using um, English uh, on the walls. So, eh. so be it. Anyway, uh, I also created a little language for this show called Starcrossed and, and a writing system. Anybody remember this? Hey, all right. <laughs> right on. It was, it was a good one season. Anyway, um, I created a language for Thor the Dark World. I, I didn't actually create this writing system for it. Uh, I created it for a fan. There was basically one fan of the language in this movie, and I created it for her so that she could write stuff out for it. Anyway, uh, I also worked on a show called Dominion that ran a couple seasons, created a, an a posteriori language derived from uh, various, uh, various real world languages for that, uh, and a, another a posteriori language for a show called The 100, called Trigeta Slang that's evolved from modern English. Um, I also got the opportunity to create a language for the second season of Penny Dreadful, which is an amazing show. It's actually my favorite show that I've worked on, and I think it's the best show on television. Everybody should watch Penny Dreadful. It's amazing. Um, and I created a language for uh, the Shannara Chronicles that just finished its first season. And then the upcoming show, Emerald City, I've created two languages. And you can probably guess what it's about based on the name and the name of uh, that language right there. Yeah. So, uh, and then a couple movies coming out this year, but I can't talk about them until they come out. So, uh, to give you a very super short introduction to the history of language creation, uh, this is it. So the first recorded language that we know of happened in the late 12th century. That was Lingua Agnota by um, Hildegard von Bingen. Uh, she was a, a German abbess. She did a lot of music, uh, and she created this, uh, not really a language, it was more of a vocabulary, uh, and not even really a proper vocabulary. It was a list of about a thousand nouns, all of them invented that she would put uh, into songs with Latin grammar and Latin verbs. Um, anyway, uh, and it was primarily a kind of religious expression, and that's primarily what you find from the created languages from that era, like uh, Bala i Balan from modern-day Turkey. Uh, after that, that was when the philosophical language movement started. That's where you saw things like uh, John Wilkins' uh, constructed language uh, that he wrote an S in, in his essay or book, um, Oh, it's gone for me. Anyway, just type in John Wilkins Conlang, you'll get it. Uh, and there were a couple of others. There was an oddball one by a fellow named Cave Beck, uh, but 
all of these uh, philosophical languages seem to be going along the same route. That is, they discovered, they thought that language was imperfect, and so they were going to create the perfect language for describing life. Um, often this involved uh, having the first phoneme of a word uh, delimit uh, what the semantic space you were going in was. The second one would delimit it further. The third one would delimit it further. The fourth one would delimit it further. So uh, words in the same category all ended up looking alike. It was almost like um, the way they classify animals, except in word form. Uh, none of these ever enjoyed much success because they were very cumbersome to both read and use. Uh, in the 1800s, that was when we started seeing auxiliary languages like uh, Esperanto, which was the most successful, but uh, the earliest was probably Volapük, and then there were many, 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 many others that followed after that. Occidental, Novial, lat Latine, Sineflexione, uh, others. I don't know. It's early for me. Um, but um, these, these kind of enjoyed a lot of popularity up until the World Wars really killed the whole gung-ho international feel of the world, I guess. Uh, but people still make these. There are probably over, I mean easily over a thousand um, auxiliary languages, international auxiliary languages. There are over a hundred that were just created for Slavic by itself, just uh, inter-Slavic languages. Um, there, there are new projects popping up every single day, uh, but none of them, of course, get any real momentum behind them, uh, except for Esperanto. Um, it wasn't until the 1900s, though, that we have records of somebody creating a language for, um, for I guess, no higher purpose than art. Uh, the first recorded example we have is Tolkien. I'm sure that there were others before that. Uh, in that century, but also probably even before. But the records were probably lost. Uh, Tolkien, we of course have records of because he became more famous for his books, which he wrote later. Um, but uh, he was a language creator first. Um, he created the books uh, partly as a way to have a world for his languages to be spoken in. That was part of the motivation that, uh, that uh, got the books going. Then, of course, his books became more famous, and so he started paying less attention to his languages, which is too bad, because a lot of what remains is fragmentary. It's kind of a bummer. Um, anyway, so uh, in the 19... Now, a lot of people were influenced by Tolkien, obviously. There were... Uh, that was the f also in the uh, 70s was the first time anybody was paid to construct a language, and also the first time that uh, an artistic language appeared on screen that was for the, the show Land of the Lost. Um, yeah, the, the old hokey show Land of the Lost that I used to watch as a kid. Uh, there was a language created for that by Victoria Fromkin, a linguist out of UCLA, for the little, um, for, well, for the Pakuni. They were like these little monkey men, kind of. Uh, they had little suits. They were kind of cute. I don't know. Um, but uh, in the 1990s, that was the very first time that there was ever a language creation community. And it came about because of the internet. That was the first time that uh, language creators actually found each other. Most language creators would live their entire lives and never meet another one um, for a couple of reasons. First, it's not that common. Uh, second, it was commonly not discussed uh, in public because uh, <laughs> it's true. No, language creation was looked at as bizarre uh, on, the, on the light end or as a signs of a very serious mental defect on the other end. Um, the very first book uh, ever written about um, invented languages was done in 1984 by a French linguist named Marina Yaguello, and it was called uh, uh, Les Fous du Langage, or uh, in English, langu Language Loving Lunatics, or... It was some, those three words were in there in some order. Um, anyway, so uh, once, once the community formed, that was when language creators started to learn from one another and figure out how to basically do things better. Um, that was also when different schools started to form, when people started specifically to create uh, engineered languages, that is, uh, taking, taking some, uh, with some constraint in mind, like, um, let's, what could you do a language that has no verbs? 
you then try to create a language that works like that without regard to whether it's artistically pleasing or whether it has an associated culture with it or not. So there were those types of languages. There were also people creating auxiliary languages. There still are. Um, and then there were people that were creating them just for artistic purposes, either because uh, they had a fictional culture that they wanted to have a language or just as a kind of an oddball art experiment. But um, what we've kind of hit on now when it comes to discussing, evaluating, or even proposing created languages is that the most important part is getting the purpose down. That is why on earth you're creating the language. Uh, and it's really, really key. It's not just uh, good enough to say, well, as long as it conveys information, that's good. It's like, yeah, that's, that's a very low bar to set. It's super, super easy to just create a language that simply conveys the relevant information. Uh, like you could think at the, very, at the most basic level, you could just have a computer program relexify the English language and then present that as a language. And it would be a language. It would work. It would just be plagiarism, right? So uh, when it comes to the purpose, uh, especially for creating artistic languages, you have to start with, well, um, why, why is this existing? Who's speaking it? Who's using it? So like, for example, if this were your speaker or user, um, you might imagine that the language would be very different. This is what's called a Rick chick. Um, and this was a, an alien invented by uh, a guy named Dennis Moskowitz. They, it's, you can see what it looks like there. It's green. It's uh, about whatever height that is. And it has this big eyeball. It has 49 tentacles down here, and it has these seven tentacles right here that are shorter and are like white on the end. Um, they have no ears or mouths, of course. So then in designing a language for them, it's pretty irrelevant what the phonology in the literal sense of it is. There is no phonology for this language. So um, what he designed was a sign language that uses their seven tentacles. Um, in a very particular way. So this is basically just one possible language that these beings could create. And the way he did it was like uh, these, uh, this little writing system he created to encode the language. The black ones are the four tentacles that kind of give you semantic information. And then each of the other three tentacles give you other information, like case, uh, how many, um, how many, uh, previous signs, the, the uh, present sign collects. So if it's zero, you basically go to the next one until you find the head. And then you realize, OK, the previous three signs all belong to a unit. That's how things modify. Um, and then I forget what the third one does, something. But so it's like, here's the insect, eats the flower. Watch very carefully what happens here. This is the insect eats in the flower, change there. And this is the flower eats the insect. And notice here, there's a little case, there's a little case, and there's the cases have switched. The word order hasn't switched, just the cases have switched. And that's how you tell who does what to whom. So um, that's, one of my, that's one of my favorite languages, just to demonstrate what you could do if you wanted to. So, uh, so then the question becomes, uh, if these are your people, what is the most appropriate language for them? What do you have to create? Um, often people will consider like, all right, well, if you want a created language that's spoken by people, why not consider a created language that's spoken by people like Esperanto? So let's take a look at Esperanto if you're unfamiliar. By the way, created in 1887 uh, by a fellow named Zamenhof. He was Polish. He wanted to create a language that the entire world would speak that would lead to world peace. Didn't work out. We still have war. Anyway, um, so here's, here's Esperanto. All right, uh, on, the, on the left there, so mi vidas, I live, mi vidis, I live, mi vidos, I will live. All right, that's, that's kind of a little verb paradigm uh, with English on the right. Now let's keep going. Uh, everything that's in red is irregular. Mi manjas, mi manjis, mi manjos, I eat, I ate, I will eat. Here's uh, English again uh, for to be, you know, our super irregular verb, mi estas, mi estis, mi estos. And here's run, mi curas, mi curis, mi curos. So you're like, OK, well, that's a little different. Here, here are the pronouns of Esperanto, or some of them anyway. Um, and uh, you see that uh, for the subject, we have the pronoun. For the object, we have a little n 
accusative case suffix. And then we have the equivalent in English. I count, uh, I, I basically count you as a regular in English because, I don't know, with the rest of them you kind of expect it to have some sort of change, but it has none. So I count that uh, non-occurrence of anything as irregular in English. So those are the pronouns of Esperanto. Now let's look at just, um, uh, you know, noun uh, singulars and plurals. Father, fathers, very regular. Uh, child, children, uh, still a regular in Esperanto, Ifano, Ifanoi. Um, goose, geese, ansero, anseroi. Uh, person, people, well, depending on your uh, opinion of whether this is a real suppletive plural or not. Uh, persono, personoi. Um, so, just comparing this to English, there are certainly always going to be areas of a language that are regular. Uh, even within a language, there's always going to be something that's regular. But uh, combine them all together, and you expect to find gunk somewhere. You know, you expect to find something a little strange going on. So uh, the, the conclusion that you have to draw is that Esperanto is really, really obviously fake. That is, if there were some, uh, if there were some country that just emerged in between the border of, you know, like France and, and, uh, and Italy, and they say, oh, and there's a brand new language that's spoken there, and you got a whole bunch of Esperanto data and gave it to linguists, they would look at it and say, no, some, <laughs> something's up here. I mean, you're in the right Indo-European ballpark, but no, something is up here. No language looks like this. So, um, so then you can't really give something like Esperanto to a group of realistic humans and say, this is their language. This is their language that's evolved over centuries to be absolutely perfect and pristine. That just doesn't happen in the real world. And so if you're creating something, that's not what you want to do. So what do you want to do? All right, so I'm going to look at four different areas of language, phonology, morphology, the lexicon, and the orthography, and show you some of the things that I've done in the languages that I have created for various things. So in English, of course, we have things like this. This is, uh, at one point in time, was a regular uh, phonological change here. Uh, I'll also, just, uh, just out of curiosity, we all have this. How many people have this? Baths versus baths. <laughs> wow, really? Uh, so, uh, so like if we're talking about like a, a noun here, you took multiple baths, you would say that? Wow, man, we're losing it. How about, how about house versus houses? All right, so that one's still around. I guess baths is a little... Anybody say houses? Okay, a couple people, a couple people. All right, all right. We're, I mean, you know, we're losing these. We're losing these, slowly but surely. But at one point in time, yeah, wife, wives, bath, baths, house, houses. Uh, nice uh, little uh, regular, semi-regular phonological pattern there. So um, this is something that, of course, should probably be in a naturalistic language. So uh, here's an example of one that I created for a language that I created for the Shannara Chronicles. Um, simple little, uh, this is a, going to be a... Um, Initial consonant mutation, a uh, simple little um, kind of like continuant maker, I guess. This is a really basic rule. So uh, here's a difference between uh, the word just by itself on the left and a word with a definite article. Uh, things, the thing is thought of as a unit. Um, oh, I guess I didn't do this in IPA, but it should be mostly, for English speakers, it should be mostly uh, figure outable. So we have Thor, Wolf, and then Uthor. The wolf on the right, pert, ero, ufert, uh, the arrow, uh, bok, uh, hole, uvok, uh, gornet, uh, shield, uhornet, uh, the shield. If you're wondering why it's not r, that's because um, producers really don't like the sounds r and ch. Uh, they describe them as Arabic y. So, <laughs> I, I, yeah, oh, I'm serious. I am absolutely deadly serious, they do. Uh, and so it's like they kind, of, uh, they kind of, whenever I try to show them a sound sample, like here's the language, and then it has, you know, ha where it should and, and all that. They listen to it and go, ooh, I don't know, it sounds, a little, it sounds a little aggressive to me. Can you maybe like change it a little bit? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, 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 I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Just get rid of all the ha and gha, and they're like, oh, it's beautiful, it's perfect. Anyway, so... <laughs> So uh, that's a, a little kind of uh, 
predictable uh, phonological pattern that you see there that you know happens in language. And of course, um, just like other phonological patterns, there are going to be places where it doesn't apply. So mirit uh, with u umirit, uh, led and u led. Uh, you can imagine that in certain languages there might be uh, an alternation there with something, but it, you know sometimes not. You know. Some language might do ukled or something like that, but uh, other times not. It's kind of just happenstance whether these things are going to happen or not. So this is a kind of mostly naturalistic, something you wouldn't be surprised to see in a natural language, hopefully. Uh, here's another one. I, I, um, I kind of like this one. It, it's, a little, it's a little wacky, um, so you're going to have to follow along with it, but I kind of like this one. I'm also terrible at pronouncing this language, so uh, my apologies. Um, this is kind of like... How do we want to say this? All of this stuff happens outside of the first two syllables of the word. Um, so it's like including the second syllable boundary. So it's like those two syllables are privileged. Every, uh, every other place, um, things start to just kind of like phonologically get a little more regularized. And um, predictably, you might expect uh, main stress in this language is initial. So we have this suffix uh, uh, that has that kind of underlying form with the M and the B. That means yellowish. So this is light, vik. Um, yellow light is vimbara. Uh, and it's, there's just a regular deletion pattern that happens when you have a word final consonant and a, and a suffix that starts with two, two consonants. You just kill the first one. So vimbara, yellow light, or yellowy light. Uh, verlit, planet. Uh, I trilled that. Verlit, planet. Verlimbara, yellow planet. So there again, we're on the boundary of that second syllable. So it's fine, you still have the B. But if you had something like this, Verlidurik, toy planet, Verlidurimara. So first thing that happened is the double consonant killed the K, so it's gone. And then the MB simplified to M outside of the first two syllables. And so that's just how you do yellow toy planet. And if you wanted to do, to be like a yellow toy planet, this is a verb. Verli luri marangu, shoot. Verli luri, ma, verli luri marangiro, that's it. Um, what's happened here is if you have a sequence like this at the end of the word, you know that originally it had to have been an angma K sequence because otherwise it would have gotten ironed out and simply been angma. But uh, with the angma voiceless consonant ones, the voiceless consonants voiced. So the distinction is preserved. It just becomes a little bit easier to pronounce as you go along. Um, also happened with the vowel, so I wanted to show a vowel example. So verlit, oh god, uh, verlit, oh, Jesus, verlit ruaro, uh, to stay at a planet. Look at the u a. Verli luriraro is to stay at a toy planet. The little uh, kind of diphthong or vowel vowel sequence just got uh, you know steamrolled there, and we lost the u. It just shows up as ah outside of the first two syllables. So um, this is another fun one. I, I like this sound change. If you if you if you start to examine uh, created languages by a particular creator, you'll start to notice things that they like. Um, and this is a sound change I'm super fond of, probably too fond of. Um, but basically where you have these uh, glides that become fricatives or stops in the presence of vowels that are very, very, very close to them. So like ya to ja, and in this case, uh, wa to va. So uh, this happens before all back vowels because the only back vowels that, are, that exist in this language are rounded. Um, so that's really what's happening here. Probably better, yeah, actually it would have made more sense to just say vowel plus round. But now I'm wondering, huh, <laughs> if this language had an e in it, would you still, hmm, hmm, would it be v or v? Oh, this is super interesting. Now I want to evolve this language forward and give myself that vowel, see what happens. Um, my sense is it would actually probably be v, so I think plus round is better. My apologies. Uh, anyway, so, uh, example, uh, a place where this would come up, uh, singular and plural. So here's an easy singular plural, kagwi, kagwa, uh, snake or snake-like thing. This was for an alien language, but they wanted words for this. And I'm like, all right, it's a snake-like thing, whatever. We, didn't, we never see the home planet, so we'll just say it is. So answer versus answers, though, we have thaiwu in the singular, thaiwe in the plural. Um, 
Ukewe uh, is bath, <laughs> bath, baths. <laughs> I didn't even recognize that. Ukewe versus Ukevu, um, and Utavo versus uh, Utawala. Utawala, that's it. <laughs> Pestle. <laughs> Uh, so the words you come up with sometimes. So um, that's just an example of some of the little phonological processes that you find uh, in, in uh, some of the languages I create that hopefully you wouldn't be surprised to see in a naturalistic language. Um, moving on to morphology, uh, this is where you can have lots more fun. So first just giving you, um, this is, uh, is this all? No, this is most of the pronouns of Dothraki. And um, yeah, yeah, like hopefully you just take a look at this and think, all right, if this were, if this were a natural language, yeah, that's fine. I expect that. Uh, there are uh, little differences here, by the way, are between um, the, uh, the uh, canonical uh, singular and plural case forms. So for a regular noun like arach, uh, no, wait, I'm sorry, regular noun like um, mahraj, mahraj is man, you would have uh, mahrajan here and maharaje, mahrajaya. There, so that's regular. But uh, anyway, so yeah, if you look at all the red ones, you'll see they 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 range from uh, kind of uh, markedly irregular to very lightly irregular, where it's like you see there's probably some sort of stem here, right? And so it shows up there and there, but it's not like this on end and gets added directly onto there. Here we have this H dropping out in the accusative and the genitive, right? These little guys are the same. Here you lost the A in there. This one, um, I guess actually, I could have marked this one as a regular because it's identical. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's, it's not Esperanto. <clears throat> it's not the most irregular uh, pronoun inventory you could imagine, but yeah, it's, it's within the realm of plausibility is the idea. Um, now for um, verbal uh, paradigms. We have, uh, this is from a cast in a different language, you have a regular paradigm here. Um, you're going to want to focus on the consonant, not the vowels. The vowels will be the same. Regular paradigm here. Irregular paradigm here. Same thing with this guy, ZZ. Here the Z becomes a J. Um, you yeah. know, but uh, not too totally out of the ordinary. There are actually some really weird ones in here that I didn't include, but they're super irregular. Um, then um, this is a, a fun example. Here is High Valerian. High Valerian has uh, several different noun uh, classes, or, or sorry, it has four noun classes or genders. And then within those genders, there are different declension classes, so that you have more or less regular plurals within class, so that if this is your nominative, this is your plural, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, there are some generalizations to draw, but uh, that's, it's like if you, if you have a word that ends in this, you can almost always predict what its plural will be. Yes? No. Well, first of all, there's always things that can inform what, what is going to be regu irregular. Like if you have that series of five cases, I think it's, it's, you're pretty safe to assume that uh, the irregulars will probably be the in, in the accusative and genitive, as opposed to the ablative and ablative. That is, you know, more irregular stuff happens in the more core cases as opposed to the more peripheral ones. But um, actually, this example should be informative as to how that type of thing comes about. Um, not for these, but for the thing that I'm going to show after this. So, uh, but I will just mention it. The, uh, uh, a lot of places where you can get this principle to regularity, and by the way, you can, actually <laughs> you can actually see some of this stuff if you compare this, is in the history of the language. So um, with these, if you're looking at that, sure, but I want you to look up here. So look at this little guy that looks like a three, no wait, a backwards three, uh, an E. That's, that's the S there, and here you have a little A ah and an A on the end. Now look at the, what counts as an S over here. This is the S, there's the A. Ah. This is the S, there's the A. Notice that there are two different S's. So, any guesses as to what happened here? They were two different phonemes that reacted differently uh, based on their environment. So at one point in the language, these were actually different sounds. This, oh, sorry, uh, this guy 
and this guy. They were different sounds at some earlier stage. And then as it evolved forward, they merged in certain circumstances. But here, palatalization applied. Um, so again, if you're thinking about the child language learner, they don't have any knowledge of this. They only have the knowledge of that and that they have to memorize it. Um, but that is essentially how all this stuff happens. Uh, you start up with an earlier stage of the language and evolve it forward to produce principled uh, irregularity, as I call it. So back to this. Um, high Valyrian, this is uh, our x, because we're going to look at stage x plus 100 or something, or x plus y. Um, so again, mostly regular within class. Then these series of sound changes applied to... Um, to basically all paradigms, all nominal paradigms. So uh, I kind of use this for root, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Um, but basically, uh, you lost final consonants uh, and final vowels. And if it, there was a double consonant at the end of the word, it got you know, regularized or, or turned into one. Basically, this is just changed a double S at the end of the word into a single S. So this happened to High Valyrian to produce a new language. Think about like Latin to Old Spanish. That's what we're seeing here for this low Valyrian or Astapori Valyrian. So after these sound changes, you ended up with situations where you have similar endings. Both of these guys end in O, but unpredictable plurals. And it's because the nominative of this would have ended in an O in High Valyrian. The nominative of this would have ended with an N in High Valyrian. So it would have been predictable in High Valyrian, but because of the sound changes that occurred, the, the uh, triggering elements were lost, and it produced essentially two different classes of plurals. So now you have to know the class in order to predict the plural. Or, or you know, you can't predict it. You need another class. And you see the same thing here. These, these ones were super irregular, but here we just have things that S and here it kind of adds an os, and here there's like a, an internal stem change. Um, and, uh, and then here are three more examples, all of them ending in a. And here you have a, a vowel change for the plural, add an s for the plural, and no change for the plural. Um, all of this was the result of uh, pretty much regular phonological change in addition to the rest of the analogical leveling that happened moving from high Valyrian uh, to low Valyrian, um, where all of the uh, noun cases were lost. Actually, I do have one more. I, li I kind of like this one. The plural of, I mean, when would you use the plural of blood? But if you had to, angry. <laughs> and, and I don't know, this one's always a favorite of mine. Habor, haburi. Again, when would you use the plural of food? And then lintor, lintori. So yeah. That is, uh, that's, kind of, um, that's kind of an overview of things that you can do with morphology. Um, I didn't really go on how paradigms change because that's, uh, that's a bit more complicated. But um, the idea is that phonological change can be the driver of morphological change, especially when you have phonological change that occurs at some key place in the word where morphological stuff happens. That's always the most fun to do. All right. So moving on to lexicon, um, this is kind of a fun example. Um, just out of curiosity, since I'm on the East Coast, uh, do you guys even read George Lakoff here? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, I, I come from the West Coast. I come from Berkeley UCSD. So, like, you know, we don't read Chomsky there at all. So. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, whatever you think about the, their synchronic stuff, uh, I love looking at, uh, at metaphor and how it can operate as uh, words change over time. So you have this language of Raytheon where we have these older words that mean kind of up or high and other words that mean down or low. In their reduplicated forms, they produce these adverbs meaning up river and down river. Um, from these, though, we derived... Uh, these uh, temporal adverbs um, after and before. And the idea was that it maps along this kind of an image schema. That is, you look at the, the life or time in kind of this way. That is, you're right here in the present. The water that's behind you is in the past. The water that's ahead of you is in the front. And that's how you got this mapping from upriver to future and downriver to past. 
um, so that you might, if this were your English phrase, first we'll destroy the roller, then we'll eat dinner, then after we'll go to sleep. You use the same word for um, upriver, essentially. I could, I could try to pronounce that. Noguneri barra shegari rola quasala shedina she she sheligo. And then it looks like that. Um, you can just trust me that that's the word. Um, all right, um, Dothraki, uh, this is another favorite example of mine, kind of extended example. So this is a tree. <laughs> that's, that's me right there. You can see my <laughs> shadow taking the picture. Um, uh, this is a pine tree, I believe. Dishatra. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Dishatra. Pine tree. It's uh, this. This word. You'll if you see a word this long, you probably think it's morphologically complex, and that's true. This is uh, some word for tree, and atzdav is um, is um, I guess smelling, but not like bad smelling, just having a strong smell. So that's a that's a word for pine tree in Dothraki, and uh, this is how you label the parts of the tree. So this big part here, had it. It's the the word for human head. Uh, lenta is the trunk. That's the word for the neck. Fotha is for the interior of the trunk, it's a word for throat, and the stuff that's underneath, all the root system, is gadima, that's a word for lungs in a human being. So you can see how there's kind of an image schema that's been used here to label parts of a tree. Um, so from that, now we have a, have a little digression. So uh, veg is stallion, vizji is stallions, because these are animate. Animates get plurals, but inanimates don't. So neguin is rock or rocks. There's just no singular plural distinction for um, uh, inanimate nouns. You can think of these as basically two genders, animate and inanimate. Um, so then you have things like this, mahraj, mahraji, man, men, chiori, chiorisi, woman, women, rach, rachi, boy, boys. Nayat, however, is inanimate. It doesn't have a uh, plural. It's, it's you know, just girl or girls. And so you think, well, why did this happen? And most of the time, people think, oh, Dothraki culture, patriarchal. Not exactly, though there is uh, some of that in there. Uh, Dothraki had this old woman, uh, Ghesi, Ghesi. That's a, a, a voiced velar fricative that doesn't exist any longer in the language that used to mean woman. Um, there's a very common and very sad uh, 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 process that happens in pretty much all languages that we found on the planet called feminine pejoration, where a word for, uh, if there's a word for the male version of something and the female version of something, the male version will become the neutral, the female version will become negative. So what happened with resi is that it turned into the modern woman, yesi, which is old woman. That is, so you only use it for older women. So then what happened is that the old world for girl, uh, tiri, became the new word for woman. Um, uh, all of these are animate. So back to the tree, remember that this is the head here and this is the neck. So what does this look like? Here's my little sister, actually. Let's see here. In Dothraki culture, uh, men and boys braid their hair. Uh, you know, it's probably like if you see some guy without a braid, it means he's lost a battle because they're supposed to cut off their braid. Um, uh, girls and women, though, don't braid their hair. So a little boy, then, who is, of course, going to have long hair, is going to have a braid. A little girl, on the other hand, is not going to. So what happened with the word for girl is that they took this pet name for daughters, Nayat, which meant straw mushroom, and started to use that for little girls. Because, you know, a, a father would call his daughter uh, his little mushroom. And then once this uh, vacancy, uh, in effect, opened up for the word for girl, the word for mushroom got borrowed over and became the new word for girl. And another more specific word for mushroom became to be used as the generic word for mushroom. And that is, in fact, why the word for girl is inanimate. It's actually the older word for mushroom because of this image schema. So. It's so an example of uh, what you do with a lexicon. Now for orthography, this is my favorite part. I love the orthography. Uh, simple thing is this, um, like uh, this is the cast than writing system. This is what it looks like on the right. This is what it looks like at an earlier stage. Uh, and this is what it looks like at an even earlier stage. Basically here it was carved into stone, very angular, none of these lines and stuff like that. Then when it got moved onto a paper-like substance with a stylus, that's when the little sharp angles started to get ironed out, and then this is the stage where they uh, type set it, uh, so to speak. 
uh, it's great because while it, you, no human being could ever like model the entire evolution of a language, it's too big, you can't actually model the entire evolution of a writing system. It's a small enough system that you could actually do it from the very earliest stages, you know, drawing, you know, uh, pictures on, on cave walls to modern times. Um, you know, uh, to the extent that it also is going to filter through different languages and that the list of languages will need to be evolved, you know, all right. But um, you can only do so much. So that's an easy thing to do because you can actually get the actual implements and try it out and then evolve them and see what happens. Um, but you can also do it with spelling. So um, you remember how I mentioned earlier when we were looking at those casteth and verbs that we had two different uh, letters that were indicative of two different sounds. Uh, here's uh, the oldest version of the phonology here. We have this nice implosive irregular B and a prenasalized B that were written in three different ways. Obviously not like that because this would have been a very old time when it was still angular and stuff. Um, they had three different sounds to represent them, because why wouldn't they? So here are some proto-forms and how they would have been pronounced and how they would have been spelled. Um, we have the three different Bs. Now here are their modern reflexes. Pronounced bada, bada, baza, bahi. Still spelled the same way, though, because the orthography was, the spelling system was cemented at an early stage. Um, and so this is how you get three different letters, all pronounced exactly the same, and you get a kind of really monstrous, monstrously irregular spelling system. So that if something starts with a B, you need to ask which B. Um, by the way, this is, a, this is a, an Abu Gita. Um, and then here's what they look like uh, intervocalically. They actually have three different pronunciations, where this old implosive stays, uh, become a regular B. The old B becomes a V. And then you actually get the reintroduction of the nasal for the prenasalized ones, but only when it uh, has a vowel preceding it. And so there they actually have three different pronunciations, um, but all slightly different ones. Um, and that leads to uh, wonderful things like this, where you have, this is how the word is actually spelled, but this is how it's pronounced, bokshwano. You just kind of have to learn it. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, we're jumping to a different language. And then you can also have little uh, practices and conventions that you throw in there, like uh, this one from Erathian, where if you have a voiceless consonant following a homoorganic nasal, you just have to write it double, just because. Uh, and this actually probably derives from the old practice where originally um, a lot of these sequences became um, nasal voiced consonant. And so this is just to kind of emphasize it. You can see it here, the, the old double T. Um, and this one is... What are the place to assimilate? Pardon? In the pronunciation, uh, two slides ago, um, why did the N go turn into an uh, N? Oh, I'm sorry. This is just the regular romanization. It's actually oh, pronounced... Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's actually pronounced Engma. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I should have done IPA. Um, anyway, so then uh, this is one of my favorites. This, this uh, post-vocalic L just uh, wreaked havoc on this language. So sequences like E-L became U, so that's Udri pronounced, but spelled with like an E-L. Um, and then uh, you can actually produce really fun little irregularities like this. So this is originally U-L, it's pronounced Udeku, bones. This is weapon, spelled with an E, pronounced exactly the same. Only difference is that little dot up here. <laughs> I love that. Look at that. Oh, it's great. So, so yeah, that is the kind of fun that I have in trying to produce languages that look and kind of feel like natural languages. That was all a bit. And the idea is uh, why to do this is because it's most appropriate, essentially. That is, if you're creating a human community, and you know, they're mostly the same, yeah, maybe they have swords and ride on horses and stuff, but you know, they got the same vocal tract, they still procreate, they still, uh, you know, uh, are born, live and die, they do all that stuff. They're basically human communities in a basically human universe. Their languages are going to evolve in basically the same way that our languages do. And so they should fall within the normal range of variation for human languages. So basically we're just trying to get better at that, better at approximating the way that human languages actually work. And right now the way that we do that is uh, emulating the evolution to the best of our ability. So. Uh, that's it. We have, I think, uh, some time for questions. This is where you can find me online. Sorry for the light on dark there. <laughs> All right. So, okay, questions on left. Yeah. Uh, so, I have a question about the evolution of orthography. 
Yes. You know, actually, I would think, uh, well, I mean, certainly reading efficiency would be uh, taken into consideration, but also writing efficiency. That is, um, if, you, well, we have a, a super small sample here, basically two letters unmodified with no vowels. But I, if you look at the whole thing, I don't know, it just feels like if you write with it a lot, it just naturally curves. It makes sense to do it that way. It's also where we moved to single glyphs for the vowels. The vowels were originally written separately. Then they came to be written together in like these glyph blocks. Um, and for me, I don't know, it felt like writing efficiency. Um, but I could see that it would probably be more efficient to read, too. It's, it's more compact. It's, it's a, a little less, well, it's a little less clumsy, to be honest. Um, <coughs> Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, but yeah, and then of course also um, you have to consider the stage at which. Uh, the writing system evolved. You can imagine that if we created a brand new writing system for English now and we didn't have to worry about anything about the alphabet, we would do it totally differently, right? Because most of us are interacting with writing on a screen. And so we could actually probably do it better. But that, you know, that rarely happens in, in natural history. Or it does and then nobody cares, you know? <laughs> they still use the old stuff. Yes? Yeah. And see how the, the, the mental design relates to linguistics. I'd be interested in knowing how much of this technology and execution and how much of this <coughs> manual or human design. Yeah, actually, it's, uh, for me, it's all manual. Um, I just, uh, I work with, uh, well, uh, pen and paper in the early stage, but then, you know, um, what do you call it? Uh, Word document uh, or the equivalent of that on Mac. Um, now, obviously, I do use a program to create fonts. Um, but I don't actually use any machinery uh, to do the linguistic evolution. There are people who do, though. Um, and the one area is with, ph is with phonology. That is, uh, there have been sound change appliers created and also uh, word form generators uh, that people use. Like a popular one online is awkwards, A-W-K-W-O-R-D-S. Uh, where um, you, can define, uh, you can define the phonology, you can define the syllable shape, you can define the word shape, and you can also enter historical sound changes that, ap that are applied in order, um, and then randomly generate stems or words. Um, I've kind of played with those in the past, and I don't like them as much. Uh, I think that the most that uh, they do for me is make sure that I'm being honest, that is, I'm using the phonology to its fullest extent. Uh, as opposed to just kind of uh, hitting the same, you know, retreading the same patterns that I like personally. Um, but eh, I still just like it better just doing it hands on. So you don't generate the morphology followed by automatically generating a lesson? Oh, God, no. Mm -mm. No, no. Yes. So, just a follow up uh, to that question. You made a comment during the talk that um, a, a person couldn't simulate the whole history of a language. Yeah. Um, except maybe in the orthography. Uh, and I wonder whether that uh, could be, it could be somewhat simulated uh, using computational means. So, you know, there's mm -hmm. been some work in uh, where people set up a lot of artificial agents that are communicating with one another and uh, new words evolve for things and they fractionate and uh, biological changes apply naturally because of uh, uh, different uh, speciation and then those dialects re need or something like that. You know, that's exactly the type of a program that we would like, you know, to feed in our, our language and then just have, like, you know, b you know, fake people use it and see what happens. You're saying this exists? I, I'm saying that there are... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so there has been some work. Um, okay. We, we can talk about this offline. I can, I can sure. Some references for you. I haven't seen anything like this uh, since about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but there was kind of a little pad in moment. People like uh, Martin Novak at Harvard uh, mm. and uh, Luke Steele's um, 
uh, building little systems of agents, communicating, because they wanted to explain things like dialects, things like compositionality uh, of semantics. Yeah, that would be amazing. Uh, things like the, uh, the development of phoneme systems. Like, like I said, like... Uh, well, it's, I, not going to, it's not going to have, uh, you know, mushroom for a little girl. Yeah, uh, well... Then it's not going to be very natural, but uh, I mean, you know, I would, I would love to. We would all love to have like a thing where, like, you could say, "Okay, here's the language as I have it," and give it to something, and basically hit the compile button and have it like try to have a bunch of conversations and say, "Okay, here's where we spotted problems that you can fix." That would be great, but yeah. But also, uh, the one thing though with uh, with the the real issue with the full evolution of language is that we don't know how it started. I mean, we, you know, we can guess everybody has theories, there's lots of people that have studied it, but we don't know for sure. We cannot trace English back to the beginning of time, right? It goes back to basically when we have written records and then what we can kind of infer before that. And that's still pretty advanced, right? So at some point in time when you're evolving a language, you just have to say, okay, this is going to be my start point before this, you know. So that that's one of the the, the big issues um, on the right in the back there, and then I'll get you. Thanks. Sure. Um. I'm not sure if, uh, <clears throat> I guess my main purpose is really, uh, it's really as an art piece. I mean, it, so that it has to, the idea behind the art is that it has to be as natural as possible and, and look like it could exist on Earth. Yeah. It could be used for communication, but to be honest, I don't care. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, and you, and you remember that these are fonts, it, it, both in the technical sense, but also in the real world sense. That's how they're printed on a computer screen. When you write them, they're naturally different. Like you know, in that uh, Arathian font, you have these nice little, you know, little diamonds for all the points. You know, those are just dots um, when you write it by hand. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, that's that's something that you work with when you're designing the language. Uh, Well, is that something we do with our written languages? Who designed them? <laughs> Who designed and optimized the English alphabet? Yeah, that's that's kind of that's basically what we try to do. We just try to evolve them, but I don't know if they op if they if they evolve for maximum optimality. Yeah. Yeah, now consider Turkish with dotless I and I. Yes. Ooh, what a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, all right, front. Uh, I was wondering what kind of packaging do you take into account uh, when you're creating the writing systems? Mm. Like uh, whether you decide to make it alphabetic or an object, or whether it's feature or yeah. how that plays in with the grammar. Um, I generally try to not do alphabets because that's the only thing that, uh, you know, anytime you've seen like art directors try to do this, that's the only thing they can manage and they look like garbage. Uh, <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of poorly designed writing systems, look at anything that has been done for any show by somebody who doesn't know anything about language. They, they come up with a random, you know, character assigned to each letter on the keyboard and then they just write English with it, right? Um, and, and usually, like, a good example of a terrible writing system is uh, from Skyrim. Um, they, they supposedly designed it so that dragons could write it, so like every character looks like a scratch. Um, 
and it, they're and they're assigned basically randomly to you know the QWERTY keyboard, um, and it looks like something that never could have evolved uh, in any society, um, and it's also it just doesn't do anything. So yeah, I uh, I I, tr I usually try to do um, you know something like Abu Gidas. I try to stay away from uh, the more complex systems because they're too big. So like the the Abu Gidas I created have between like you know. Uh, 700 and 800 characters, um, most of them uh, combinatorial, whereas like, you know, um, a system like, like Chinese would have thousands upon thousands upon thousands, and, um, and, and each of those will have their own internal uh, evolutions in history, and it's very difficult to create. I've done one of those before, but only for one of my languages. And, uh, no. that, uh, particular this, this, this yeah. No, that was just the way it evolved. I actually, it, with all the, the loops and stuff, I was like, ah, I don't know, this is going to be kind of tough to write and stuff. But then when I was taking a look at Thai, I was like, damn, they got a ton of little loops in there, and they seem to tolerate it, so I figured it was good. <laughs> yeah. So how often do you find yourself putting in cognates with English or other languages that you know? Never. That was totally random. Okay. Yeah. And like the, okay, so you have the children that just happen to also be irregular in a similar way as the translation of language you're trying to work for. So what do you mean? You had a slide that had um, the different, uh, so the irregular plural of children. Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't irregular. I, um, how to, how to say this? Uh, <coughs> it wasn't, it, so yeah. Um, not unless it's uh, not unless it's an a posteriori language, uh, but something also to keep in mind, especially with irregularities, they're going to happen with a very small subset of the language most of the time. Usually, words that are very old and get used a lot, so it shouldn't be it shouldn't be surprising to find an irregular plural of man if there's a regularity in plurals in a language in any language that you'll ever find. Um, probably pretty rare to find an irregular plural in something like disenfranchisement. Um, or it's equivalent in any language that you find. Yeah. yeah. Um, you and then. Oh yes. No, oh, this is this is fun. Um, so uh, cast. Of the, so in this uh, in the Defiance universe, right? There are a bunch of different aliens. One alien per planet, because whatever. Um, I didn't create that. Um, but um, they. Um, the, the Castellans were the ones that were culturally dominant. They have a base 20 uh, number system. And so it was kind of fun because that system got moved over to Erathian, uh, which had originally a base 18 system. Hold on, let me see. Because they would count like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Base 18. So they had a base 18 system. All right. And so when you look at the words for the numbers 1 through 20, because they started with the base 18 system, they now have base 20 because of the influence of Castathon. You see that um, their word for 18 is, is kind of simple, uh, as it's like kind of the new unit. Their word for 19 is 18 and 1, and their word for 20 is borrowed directly from Castathon. And then from 20 on, it follows the, the Castathon system. Where you know, like you have a borrowed word for forty, a borrowed word for sixty, and things like that. So that's that's um, that's a lot of fun. Um, just working with writing systems. Uh, I think uh, Dothraki I just did, uh, and Hivai Valyrian I just did base ten because I was working with George R. R. Martin's stuff, and if it ever got used, I didn't want there to be errors. Like I could have done something different, but then if he decided to use a number, he would probably default to base ten, and it might get yeah. There would be inconsistencies, and of course, he would win out if there were inconsistencies, so I don't you know, didn't want to bother with that. But yeah, I don't know, just uh, whenever I'm coming up with a new number system, I, I try to come up with something that could naturally exist. I, I don't know if we've seen base 18, but I think I came up with a really good uh, way that you could get base 18. Because, I mean, come on, you can do that. You can imagine that. Ugh. I think, it, I think it could work. I think it could work. I wouldn't be surprised if we found a natural language, you know, somehow that had base 18, even if we haven't found one yet. I think it could work. Yes? So I was thinking about, like, you know, how to evaluate the naturalness of some of these languages. 
Yeah. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> I mean, there, there, are probably like, there are probably a handful of people that are pretty good with Dothraki and High Valyrian, and then also Tree get a sign. But um, outside of that, no. It, it's like definitely not enough. And I mean, none of the actors speak any of the language at all. Uh, they, just, they, just mimic, you know, they just mimic my pronunciation um, when I send them the MP3s. Um, but uh, something that is a confounding factor that you see a little bit with Esperanto is the desire to keep it canonical. Um, so there are actually, there are tons of Esperanto speakers, but it's like they resist um, evolving it and changing it because they want it to be the same as when the guy created it. Uh, even so, you'll see little changes because there's been at least one study of how the accusative N in Esperanto is used with native speakers, because there are native speakers of Esperanto that are raised with that as an L1. Um, and you see variation there. But usually it's like if they keep up with the language, um, they'll kind of revert back to the canonical usage a lot, uh, simply because of this external reason. I suspect that if there were people that spoke my languages fluently, they would probably do the same thing. They would try to resist that evolution. Even if I said, don't do that, they probably still would. <laughs> my guess. Yes? Yeah. Um, I have a, a BA in linguistics, also English from UC Berkeley, and a master's in linguistics from UC San Diego. Um, and then I've been creating languages that entire time. You'll find a lot of language creators, though, that just get it uh, kind of through osmosis through the community, just because you, you, you learn stuff. Like on the constructed languages list today, there was um, somebody who, uh, there was somebody just in a natural discussion we were talking about. Uh, I mean, things like uh, suffix alfnama and kair dild came up, uh, which is an Australian language, and also uh, ECM, exceptional case marking, came up in the same discussion. So if you think about just, you know, the 12-year-old language creator just wanting to jump in, they just kind of start picking up on this stuff, use Wikipedia to fill in the blanks. Um, most of the time, these, uh, these kind of like homegrown linguists that are conlangers, they get to like Ling 101 and discover they know absolutely everything. It's not until they get more advanced that they really start to see. And then you know, they also start to figure out what they learned imperfectly. Uh, but in my case now, classical linguistics, um, at least classical West Coast linguistics. Yes? Oh, good Lord, no. I mean, um, there is, uh, for Trigata sign, which has evolved from modern English, uh, there is... English syntax that we lost subject ox inversion in that one. Um, but no, all the rest of them, I mean, for, for word order, it just depends on what the language is. Um, done all different types, uh, you know, dominant uh, head final, dominant head initial, mixed head final, mixed head initial, um, all different types, many different placements of determiners. Um, as far as syntactic analysis, it's not useful when uh, creating a language. Um, I'll leave that up to syntacticians to analyze it later if they feel like it, depending on whatever the dominant framework happens to be at the time. But uh, as far as uh, word order goes, it's like it's more, it more starts with um, typological gener generalizations and then deciding if a particular construction, whether it's a, a noun phrase or a prepositional phrase, is going to follow the dominant order or if it's going to be uh, changed for some particular reason. And then when it comes to uh, clause level uh, things, you know, yeah, you design, of course, uh, relative clauses, subordinate clauses, WH questions, yes, no questions, uh, topicalization, anti-topicalization, if it's going to be in there. Um, and a lot of this, of course, there will also be things that follow stuff that happens naturally in language. So you'll always see heavy shift because that just happens. Um, but um, a lot of the like peculiar syntax is going to be driven by the verbs themselves. And so it'll actually be lexical information. That is, when you create the verb, uh, you, cr you essentially create the verb frame for how it's used. So if this thing is going to take a subordinate clause or not, and if it does, is it going to be something where it's like the, the, uh, the, uh, the little guy down here, sorry, the, the, 
uh, embedded subject or a subordinate subject is going to have like some special case marking, if it's going to be a brand new nominative, if it's going to move up and be an object or something, all that is done on the verb itself. And of course, uh, that's informed by the various verb classes that you have. And when I say verb classes, I mean a la Beth Levine, um, what's her work, the big one? Uh, classes of English verbs. Anybody know this word? Yeah, yeah, where she has got like, there's like a hundred classes of verbs in English that all behave differently. So that's the type of thing that you, uh, you kind of recreate by hand. And hopefully if you're doing it right, it does not completely mimic some language. Yes? So, speaking of that whole 12-year-old gets curious about the internet and what is the listed class, well, it's that's why it's just been major and I'm like in 300 bubbles, cogsite classes, but anyways, Yeah. This set of sounds instead of, um, like, like, how do you go about thinking, first of all, what words should actually go in the place? Because you can't really comprehensively just think about a spot. And second of all, designing the words themselves. You can do one of those little maps, or at least, uh, I mean, this is nothing, I, I, don't, I don't really go through it scientifically, but you can do one of those little yes no maps. So I mean, the, the very first question is like you come, you encounter a concept, and it's like first question is should this be a word in this language at all? And that's going to be decided on depending on whatever the fictional context is. So it's like nothing that's super high level technology is going to belong as a word in Dothraki at all. It's like if you're using it just as a person, you can sure you can just borrow it in from English if you want and just fill in the rest of the language as fit. But it's not going to be a canonical word, so that's rejected. However, if it should belong in the language, then you get to a next branching question, which is, should this be uh, a native word or should it be a borrowing? If it's a borrowing, then you get into a question of, okay, which language is it going to be borrowed from? You find, if that language has been created, then you borrow the word from that and you modify it phonologically depending on when about it should have been borrowed. Um, so with, with High Valyrian, I'm sorry, with Dothraki, there are High Valyrian borrowings because they exist there. With, uh, but no borrowings from other languages because those languages don't exist. In our real world, they haven't been created by me. Um, with, um, with Defiance, there were borrowings from all over the place. From different alien languages before they hit Earth, from English once they came to Earth, and from other alien languages as they came to Earth. And they, were, they borrowed through languages. So it would be like X borrows from Y, which borrowed it from Z. Um, if it's not going to be a borrowed word, if it's going to be a native term, then you have to ask yourself a separate set of questions. Should this be its own root? Is it basic enough that it should be a, its own root that goes back to time immemorial, like a word for son, as in progeny? Probably a very, very, very old word. You're probably fine with just saying, okay, here's the root for this, apply the sound changes, there it is. Um, or did it evolve from a different root? And it, and then the question is, did it evolve directly? How it used to mean X, now it only means Y? Or, it's, or is it something like, here is X, here's related definition Y, here's related definition Z? And so you do it like that and, and evolve it from the older word. Or um, would it be derived from another word via some regular derivational process? So it's like this, you know, add a suffix to this root and you get this word. Um, and um, Let's see, have I missed any? Or should it be like onomatopoeia? There's, there's al that's always an option at any point in time. Um, and so that's basically the process that you go through when creating words. Now, when you come to the point of creating roots, where you just have to say, all right, it's just going to be a root. What sound do I want? Like, you can do whatever you want as long as it fits the phonology. Um, and I have never, ever, ever had a problem with this. Um, but I know that there are lots who do. If your problem is you don't want to uh, allow biases to creep in, that's when you should go to a phonology generator, uh, a root generator. Because then you can just generate something, grab it at random, and know that there was no bias at all that, uh, that, you know, that factored into it. Uh, at the same time, sometimes you do want a little bias. Like, you, you see some, you know, uh, phonosemantics in there, like, you know, high vowels associated with small things, big vowels, or low vowels associated with big things. Um, doesn't always work, as in the English words big and small, but, you know, there are always going to be, you know, 
little uh, little snippets here and there. So sometimes you do want your bias to creep in, your your linguist understanding to help help you choose a root. But uh, 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 that is exactly basically what a phonology generator is for. So something like awkwards, so you don't have to worry about your bias um, in dis in uh, defining a root. So does that help? Cool. All right. Okay. Thank you.